Julio, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you to uh, Atonium, um, to Yo and his team and to all the, the previous um, speakers. Um, this has been a very useful and interesting experience. And as uh, Paula just said, um, you know, we, it, it was great to look at some of the emerging applications that we may not come across uh, as academics. My background is in social science and communications. Um, and while we had some disagreements, I think we had a very collegial experience uh, and that's mostly reflected in, in the final report or the final report that is coming. Um, most of my, my work and my research has been done um, really both working with the engineers and computer scientists who are trying to design things uh, and then also digging in the trenches afterwards of the users to see if what was promised or sold actually works in practice. And I think uh, this equally applies to our regulatory frameworks as it does to our technology. Do they apply in practice? How do they work in practice? So not only does the technology work in practice, but does the regulation actually work in practice? And um, some of the areas that I've been researching around the games industry and also around communication governance is, uh, has provided us with some great examples really of where there are struggles to apply things in practice. Uh, and when we start to think about regulation in the space, one of the key things that strikes me from when we used to talk about um, uh, uh, legacy media, so to speak, um, is that the nature of these applications and infrastructures is the fact that they are constantly updated. So this is not, this is both a risk and an opportunity. It means that if we find something that isn't working in technology and in regulation terms, we can think about how to adjust it and to update it. But it also means that if we are regulating and auditing, it can't be a one-off. It has to be done frequently and regularly to see if the new systems and the updates and the new algorithms or the new data sets are actually working in the way that we thought. So I think the first point that we need to make, which is perhaps simple, but applies both to technology and regulation, is that these are systems that are constantly updated. And so we need to think about whatever we put in, in place afterwards as something that will need to be also constantly updated. Um, one of the things that we have found when we look at public uh, surveys of understanding around AI, um, and, and often we think that people are only uh, driven by science fiction in their understandings of AI, but in actual fact, people are in many countries at least, hard, not globally, but at least in a lot of Europe, uh, we can see that people's experiences with social media and in games are the two areas I've been looking at. People are starting to understand how AI works. They are, they are starting to understand how they're being targeted. They're starting to be, uh, understand personalization. They're starting to understand what is transparent and what isn't transparent. And I think we have to understand and think about this, that actually in the general public, uh, at least in some of the general public surveys we've done, we were pretty impressed by the kind of basic knowledge of AI that a lot of people are starting to, to build. And that people have high, high expectations of AI. And not surprisingly, because we have now over 10 years of government and European reports focusing on innovation in AI and companies promising great things from AI. So we have high expectations and we have to be really mindful of the fact that these may not be met if things don't work in practice. And so we're at a really cru crucial moment, both for the companies and for regulators and academics, I think, many of which, of course, we can't really talk about us and them. We, we work together on many of these issues, of course, is really how do we build a, a kind of trustworthy system uh, at this moment in time? Because we know from whistleblowers, we know from stories in the media, and we know from important social science critical research that is starting to emerge I'm thinking about automating inequality in North America. I'm thinking about some of the work being done by our colleagues um, in the Data Justice Lab and our colleagues in, in Amsterdam on infrastructures about how things actually work in practice. We know that there can be really serious consequences for our workers, for users, for societies and democracies. And so far we haven't spoken so much about the workers who have to work in 
the tech companies, but also whose work is changed fundamentally by some of these systems, including media workers. So if the content is being automated, or if the communications are being automated, what is the new role for media workers in these spaces? Uh, most of the jobs in many of the industries are in community moderation and support end, and not in the original content creation end. And I think as media scholars, we have to really think about this, about who is creating the content and what does that mean for our understanding of the role of the media in democracy? Let me just say a, a couple of things, perhaps in relation to the seven key requirements. Um, I don't want to say exactly what's in the report. So let me just point to one or two things that, that I had raised and I thought were important. First of all, when we talk about diversity, um, many of us rightly are focusing on racial and gender diversity, um, but, but there are other forms of diversity we need to think about. Um, one of our previous speakers folks focused on ability uh, and how AI is both helping and hindering around issues of ability and disability. But also as European scholars uh, and European regulators, I think uh, linguistic diversity is often overlooked as kind of a crucial area, perhaps for innovation, but also uh, where we're seeing problems with many of the tools that aren't built with linguistic diversity in place, right? Those of us who come from countries with minority languages, you know, uh, in Ireland, we happen to have the European headquarters for many uh, different uh, European, uh, North American, uh, and also increasingly Asian companies. And I think what's interesting is because of that, we sometimes see uh, the Irish language being included, whereas otherwise, why would a company necessarily develop a tool for such a small language speaking community? Now, AI, put, really offers us some interesting supports and possibilities for supporting minority languages if we can make sure that we're not also losing the nuances and flattening out those languages by actually automating the tools. Um, so I think when we think about diversity, we should think about it in that broader sense and think about cultural and linguistic and maybe ability forms of diversity. My second point really on, on, on kind of regulation, accountability and transparency beyond the fact that these things are constantly updated. I think what we're really finding, it, it's easy for us to say there's a black box in design and we need to see how these things work. But for many of us who work outside of maybe the main centers of either the research or the work or the main universities perhaps, getting access to the data uh, and the tools or the algorithms being used by companies is incredibly difficult. The APIs, for many reasons, good reasons, in some uh, uh, circumstances, are being closed down. So how can independent researchers access and do research to audit uh, and understand what's going on in the black box? If companies do deals with particular research centers or charge a lot of money for this, you know, we really need to think about at the European level, is this something that Europe can focus on is the access to the data for independent researchers. Um, so thinking about that, I think will also be important. Um, finally, we, we have done some really important work, I think, in terms of thinking about empowerment by de design. We still have to think about how that works as we work through that in terms of the researchers and the people we're bringing together. Uh, interdisciplinarity, we talk a lot about it. We have tried to obviously work it through in many projects. It's still not really embedded in many areas of education. And I think it's going to be really crucial when we bring it right back into our universities, many of us who work in different disciplines, how do we speak across those boundaries between the technical sciences and the social scientists and our, our colleagues in humanities and other areas. I do think when we talk about education in this area and the, the different educational programs being rolled out, we should think about how actually the interdisciplinarity works in practice without losing the strengths of each of the disciplines, but how we can actually communicate and work together across these. Um, and the final thing I will say is that given the emerging green agenda in Europe, 
uh, uh, I think we have to be thinking about um, regulation, not as a barrier to innovation, but actually as a driver of innovation. And we need to connect that to the larger Green Deal focus. So really bringing back in the environmental well-being as well as the social well-being, I think would be really helpful, not just in this sector, but in all of the sectors. So thank you. Thanks a lot.